November 29, 1894, the Rideau Record, Smith's Falls, Ontario. Value of Royal Crowns. Regal crowns are an expensive luxury. One of the most costly crowns in existence is that of the King of Portugal. The jewels which ornament it are valued at $8 million. The crown which the Tsar of Russia wears on special occasions is also one of the most precious in the world. The cross which surmounts the crown is composed of five magnificent diamonds resting on a large, uncut, but polished ruby. The small crown of the Tsarina contains, according to authorities, the finest stones ever strung. The crown of the Queen of England, which is valued at $1,800,000, contains a great ruby, a large sapphire, 16 small sapphires, 8 emeralds, 4 small rubies, 1,360 brilliants, 1,273 rose diamonds, 4 pear-formed pearls, and 269 of other shapes. In his state clothes, including the crown, the Sultan of Johor wears diamonds worth $12 million. His collar, his epaulets, his girdle, and his cuffs sparkle with the precious stones. His bracelets are of massive gold, and his fingers are covered with rings which are almost priceless. The handle and the blade of his sword are covered with precious stones. The most costly insignia of princely dignity, however, are those of the Sultan or Maharaja of Baroda in India. The chief ornament is a necklace of five strings containing 500 diamonds, some of which are as large as hazelnuts. The upper and lower rows consist of emeralds of the same size. January 7, 1899, The Branford Opinion Branford, Connecticut, for women's benefit. The Tsarina's exquisite piano. Tsar Alexander sent to Stuttgart for a suitable present for the Empress on the occasion of her recent birthday celebration. He selected an ornate upright piano for her boudoir. The case is in the richest Louis XVI style, and the front board is jeweled with brilliant gems. The black keys are made of real ebony, and the white ones are covered with mother-of-pearl. German experts say it is the most costly and exquisite instrument of its kind ever made. June 19, 1923. The Age. Melbourne, Australia. The Romanov Jewels. Soviet tries to realize enormous value in diamonds. London, 18th June. The Berlin correspondent of the Daily Telegraph states that M. Krestinsky, the Bolshevist ambassador in Berlin, has a safe in the embassy in the Unter den Linden containing 30 pounds weight of diamonds. The gems, which are large and of the finest water, have been brought from Russia since the beginning of the year by diplomatic couriers. Krestinsky is charged with the task of selling the diamonds, which are now being classified and valued. Some of the jewels are of extraordinary size. Undoubtedly, they belonged to the murdered imperial family. An American is in treaty for the gems, but a very heavy import duty imposed by the United States government is a bar. The Bolshevist agents, however, are organizing a scheme to smuggle some of the gems into the United States by way of Canada. Ten times as many jewels still remain in Moscow. A special guard has been placed over the treasure, which is stored in the Kremlin, as it forms an easily transportable reserve in case the Bolshevist leaders have to fly hurriedly. This enormous concentration of diamonds has alarmed the professional dealers who say that it will take the market 10 years to absorb such a quantity of big gems. The leading dealers are therefore trying to organize a world boycott against the Bolshevist diamond dealers. November 26, 1923, Aurora Daily Star, Aurora, Illinois. 
lost trail of Russian crown jewels found, Prince of Yusupov to be held, to prove gems are his. By William P. Flyth, Universal Service Staff Correspondent. Washington, November 25th. The long lost trail of the Russian crown jewels was renewed with a hue and cry by American customs officers on the arrival of Prince Felix Yusupov in New York today. On orders from Washington, the jewels, which the prince proposes to market here, will be held until it can be conclusively established that they are his personal property, and even then, they may not be sold until a royal ransom in the way of duty is paid. More troubles. This, however, is just the beginning of the troubles of the Russian nobleman who makes a boast of having been the prime conspirator in the group that brought the assassination of the monk Rasputin. Rasputin was the confessor of the late Tsarina and blamed by most diplomatists and many Russians as having been responsible for the downfall of the monarchy and the collapse of Russia during the World War. Even should the prince escape the suspicion of bringing to this country the crown jewels, he will still have to encounter the immigration law which applies alike to prince and pauper, it was stated. One may be convinced of a murder for political purposes and come to this country as a refugee, it was stated. But when one admits an assassination without conviction, he is automatically barred. The prince, in the opinion of labor officials, comes within the latter class, and instructions have been issued to hold him for an investigation. The avowed purpose of Prince Yusupov is to buy from Joseph E. Widener, the Philadelphia millionaire, two Rembrandts, which he sold to the well-known connoisseur two years ago for $500,000. At that time, he declares he was in desperate need of cash, but reserved the right to buy them back at the purchase price within two and one-half years. Nathaniel G. Van Doren, head of the Custom Intelligence Service, said that he had been advised of the departure of the prince and believed from the beginning that through him he would be able to pick up the trail of the jewels. Since the revolution and assassination of Tsar Nicholas, he declared, every bit of information his agents had been able to pick up abroad indicated that an effort would be made to market the jewels in the United States. I cannot understand, he said, why anyone possessed of the jewels claimed by Prince Yusupov should have been hard up for cash two years ago and at this time be able to bring to this country sufficient gems to market for $500,000. I have telegraphed my agents in New York to hold the jewels until they can be identified. They will have to be compared with specifications of the jewels belonging to the late Tsar which we have in the department. We are firmly convinced that many efforts have been made to get the crown jewels into the United States and sell them. Everyone remembers that several months ago we exhumed the body of a seaman in the Brooklyn Cemetery on the theory that the gems had been brought into this country in the casket believed to contain the body of a sailor who had died in the Far East. This seemed far-fetched, probably, but it is merely indicative of what we think of the effort to get the jewels into this country. Not only are we watching every foreign arrival for some trace of them, but we are also watching Americans who return from abroad and freight shipments. In spite of what is said in Russia, no one today can say publicly where the crown jewels are, and we must exercise the greatest precaution. The two pictures which Prince Yusupov sold to Widener were Rembrandt's A Portrait of a Man and A Portrait of a Woman. They are said to have come into the possession of the prince's ancestors during the reign of Peter the Great. For years they hung in the Tsar's unlighted studio and viewed only by express permission from him. The customs service, always with a fine eye for art, 
let it be known in this connection that some question may be made of the right of Yusupov to take the pictures back, even should he be permitted to buy them. Mr. Van Doren said that in view of the fact that this country had collected so many fine works of art, a law should be enacted prohibiting their exportation, such as already is in force in practically all of the old world countries. He indicated that something of the kind may be recommended by the Department to Congress.